Welcome again, everyone, and we will begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle within us the fire of thy love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, we come to the end of the section on our kind of larger topic of spiritual warfare. We come to the end of our fallen human nature, which is called in the kind of our spiritual tradition, the flesh, right? So, again, just to remind you, there are three parts of it three parts of our fallen human, human nature, or maybe three aspects of it. So you have, and this comes from, uh, from the Bible, from the first letter of St. John, uh, chapter 2, verse 16. Uh, the pride of life, the concupiscence of the flesh, which we looked at last week, and then the uh, concupiscence or the lust of the eyes, which is what we're going to look at today. And the so-called seven deadly sins or the seven capital sins fall under those three categories. So underneath the pride of life, we had pride itself. Then we had envy and anger. Then in under the concupiscence of the flesh, uh, we looked at ways that we can be excessively, we can love excessively or in a disordered way, sensual pleasure understood again, three of the seven deadly sins as gluttony, lust, and sloth. And now we come to the, the third and the final section of our fallen human nature. And then we'll look at two other enemies uh, in the next two weeks. So we're looking today at what's called the concupiscence of the eyes. So there's only one of the seven deadly sins, if you're doing the math, there's only one of the seven deadly sins that's left. Uh, and that is avarice or greed. But there are kind of two parts to it. So we're going to look at these at both of these parts. The first is of these two parts of uh, the concupiscence of the eyes is avarice or greed, kind of properly speaking. So what is avarice or greed, first of all? Nice, tidy little definition. It's an excessive love of earthly goods or money. An excessive love or of earthly goods or money. Is it wrong to desire money or earthly goods? No, because they have a purpose, don't they? What is the purpose of money or earthly goods? Well, it's to provide for the needs that we have, the temporal needs specifically, like life or the, the lives of the people that we're responsible for, like your families, or developing ourselves, kind of the different... Uh, the different kind of elements or aspects of who we are as people. Uh, we need money or we need possessions in order to do this. So they have, it has a purpose. But just like all of these other vices, we can see that we can love this. Uh, we can love these things to um, to a sort of like a, in a disproportionate kind of a way. We can love it excessively. So that's what avarice is. Avarice or greed is an excessive love of earthly goods or money. Now, what's the motivation of greed or avarice? Well, it can come from too strong of a desire to have all of the things that money can buy. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple there. Uh, we love money excessively because of all the things that it can bring us. Uh, I remember uh, a guy telling me once, he said, you know, they say, Money doesn't buy happiness, but it sure doesn't hurt. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I think sometimes it can hurt. But um, what he and obviously uh, all of us understand is that uh, money does get you a lot of things. And uh, we can love the things that money can buy too excessively. But that's not the only reason why we can be inclined to love money to excess. It can also come from a fear. 
a fear that seeks security. Security for now and security for the future. And it seeks it in money or financial stability. Sometimes it's fear that drives us to an excessive love and desire for money or material goods, earthly goods. So we can fall into avarice or greed in three different ways, right? So we can have the wrong intention when we're kind of thinking about money, let's say, or thinking about material goods. We can have the wrong intention. We can also go about acquiring it in the wrong way and we can spend it in the wrong way. All right, so first of all, let's look at the, the intention. If we love material goods or money without any reference at all to the origin that they have or for their purpose, then we're going to be inclined to love it excessively. So if we don't see what we have as being ultimately from God, and if we don't see that it has a purpose, a God-given purpose, and it's not just sort of a, there for us to make of it what we will and to enjoy and accu accumulate as much as we can and enjoy it as much as we can, but it actually has a purpose. If we don't have those two things kind of pretty clear in our minds and live according to them, we could be inclined to love money excessively. So again, what's the purpose of money and material goods? It's to provide for our temporal needs, our life, the lives of the people around us, development of others, um, to provide also, and this is really important in our Catholic tradition, it's in scripture, and it's also in like down throughout all of our tradition. The purpose of money also is not just to provide for us and our needs, not just to provide for the people around us immediately like our families, but also to provide for those who are most in need, to provide for the poor. Why do we have money? Why has God given us money? Well, so that we can take care of ourselves and other people, particularly not forgetting the poor. And uh, yes, very good. So the second way that we can fall into <clears throat> kind of a, a, the vice of greed is by going about acquiring money uh, or acquiring material goods, land, property, that sort of thing, in the wrong way. So if we love something to excess, uh, we can do whatever we have to do in order to get it, right? Um, and that goes for, for money or for things as well. We can go about getting it immorally without caring about who we have to step on in order to get it or the cost, the cost of, let's say, um, you know, getting ahead. The cost, not only maybe it, it hurts other people directly and it's kind of like an immoral, an immoral sort of a thing, but also think of like people who tend to like workaholism, maybe. Think of like the cost of your family life, your marriage or, you know, your children. We can go about acquiring it in the wrong way. And then the third is looking at how we spend it. If we spend reluctantly, miserly, and we want to accumulate as much as we can, as much as possible, then we're, we're dealing with a, an example of, of avarice, right? Or if we spend it, okay, maybe we, maybe we spend it, comfortably, but we think very little and give very little to the poor, to those who are most in need. There you go. Again, you can understand it's a misuse of what is God given and what God has a purpose for. Okay. So what are the remedies then for avarice? How do we fight against avarice? Well, uh, the first thing is remembering that we can put our trust in God. Again, one of the main motivators for people's, for people being greedy uh, is not just, you know, a sort of like, 
love of pleasure and all the stuff that money can buy often it's a fear, uh, a fear of, you know, uncertainty and, you know, bad things happening and a looking towards money as though that's going to give you the, the guarantee of, um, you know, that disaster would be averted or that, uh, that you, you won't suffer or your family won't suffer unnecessarily. So the first thing is combating that fear that's kind of underlying and it's uh, often where we mightn't even be aware of it. We combat that by remembering that we have a God whom we can trust. You'll remember Jesus saying this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, consider the birds of the air that sow not nor reap, nor gather into barns. Consider the lilies of the field that labor not, neither do they spin. This isn't to excuse or kind of inspire laziness in us or sloth, but it's to eliminate anxiety, to ease the sort of anxiety that we can sometimes experience and to do our work strong and confidently, knowing that God is a provident father who gives us what we need when we trust him, when we trust him. The second way that we can fight against greed is again, kind of a, it's almost, <laughs> it's framing it in a slightly different way. Uh, remembering that wealth actually doesn't do what we think it does. We grasp at it, you know, whether it's money itself or land or whatever it is, uh, money doesn't insulate us from suffering. It doesn't guarantee that, you know, we're going to be okay that disaster is not going to befall us. Um, in fact, there comes a point, there will come a point in every one of our lives when our well-being and our security won't depend on how much money we've made or what we've acquired, but on what we have done in love and how much faith we've had. There'll be a time at the end of our lives when we stand before God, when all of that doesn't matter at all. Our bank account doesn't matter. Uh, our, any sort of portfolio, the, the car that you've got in the driveway, all of that will matter nothing. But only what we've done in love and the faith that we've had. Jesus makes this point in another passage from, uh, from the gospel, this time of St. Luke. This is from Luke Chapter 12, it's the parable of the rich fool. I'll just read it for you here. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to him, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. To be rich towards God uh, means not only to care about first things first or to put first things first, but it also means uh, to be generous, particularly with the poor. That's like a, a constant theme in the Bible uh, through the prophets and then in Jesus as well. So last kind of way that we combat greed is by generosity, basically. Look for the needs of the people around us and particularly for the poor. And from the excess that you have, 
give very, very generously. This is not easy. Um, it might even hurt. It might be a little bit painful. Um, that pain is a good sign. It's a sign that you're kind of bending back against this inclination that's not healthy. God has given us all that we have. We can't take it with us. And we want to be good stewards of it. We want to, we want to kind of, uh, to carry all things that we have lightly. And that we want to provide for the people that we need to be providing for. Okay, so that's greed or avarice proper. But there's another aspect to it, right? In concupiscence of the eyes. And that is curiosity. Now, you might be surprised to hear that curiosity is a vice. We don't often, we, I've never, before I was like, started to look at these things, I never thought that curiosity was a vice. We tend to think of curiosity as a great thing, that it's like the virtue of an inquiring mind. But if we look at it more closely, and if we're really honest, uh, we see that it's not that at all. It's actually something else. Curiosity is this, again, a nice tidy definition. It's an excessive desire to know what's going on in the world, in the world, not in order to derive spiritual profit, but to indulge our craving for frivolous knowledge. It's an excessive desire to know what's going on in the world, not for any spiritual benefit or profit at all, but only to indulge the craving we have for frivolous knowledge. Now, this is a modern <laughs> vice. This is a modern thing that we're all very familiar with. So St. Thomas Aquinas, and I think it was just St. Thomas, he, he might have been borrowing from somebody else, but I, I can't remember that this exactly, but he definitely um, categorized it in kind of four parts. He said that we can have like, an improper or unhealthy uh, desire for knowledge or certain, a certain type of knowledge in four ways. There are four ways. So the first is by kind of forsaking learning about more important things for the less important. So by pursuing the knowledge of unimportant things and then neglecting the objectively more important, that's one. Number two is by uh, seeking knowledge through teachers that we cannot have recourse to. So like the demonic, like demons. The third, and I'll go through, each, I'm just going to, I'm just hitting all four of them right now. And then I'll just going to say a word about them. So the third is by losing sight of what's eternal and getting caught up in learning about things that are, that's only in the here and now. And the fourth is by seeking to know things that are beyond our capabilities. Okay, so first of all, by wanting to, by, by uh, kind of going about learning things, uh, yeah, pursuing kind of knowledge of things that are less important and neglecting that which is objectively more important. This is very uh, common, okay? So look, for instance, at how fascinated people are with celebrities, like, it's just, there's a whole industry. Like you go, you go to the news, any kind of news site, and a big chunk of the news is about these different people and their lives and, you know, all sorts of just like little, little things, little details like that. Frivolous knowledge. It can extend to other things as well. Maybe it's not celebrities for you. Maybe it's, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's kind of, uh, you know, spending lots and lots of time on Netflix or, uh, you know, kind of reading novels indiscriminately and just sort of like just book after book after book, but where there's nothing beneficial. There's nothing, it's not benefiting you in any way. Or maybe it's scrolling endlessly through your phone or through social media. This is the kind of frivolous knowledge that he's talking about.
getting distracted by something that piques my curiosity instead of doing what I should be doing. This is the kind of um, appetite for frivolous knowledge that we have. And curiosity is just like the indulging of that, you know, just kind of flitting from thing to thing to thing. Our goal isn't to be intellectually lazy, by the way. The virtue that's opposed to curiosity isn't ignorance, it's studiousness. Studiousness is the virtue. Studiousness is the thing we want to aim for. So curiosity is the sort of like superficial and easy consuming of information. It's flitting from thing to thing to thing and stuff that is in no way beneficial to you. It's the junk food of the mind, right? Studiousness is work. It's to look at things that are objectively more important or that's in some way beneficial to you and uh, to really spend time with it, to go deeper with it. It's the meat and potatoes, the substantial food of the mind. Studiousness entails sacrifice. Curiosity is just self-indulgence. It's kind of, again, like going to check Facebook or Instagram and then realizing that two hours has passed, right? When you're studying something, when you're working at something, uh, it, it's not like that. It's, it's, you actually put, have to put an effort in. Okay, the second way that we can... Uh, kind of have an unhealthy desire for knowledge is by inquiring through teachers that we can't have recourse to. So St. Thomas mentioned specifically uh, demons. So think of those who try to like manipulate spiritual realities in either psychic or new age practices in order to acquire knowledge. That's just like, it's a, it's a, it's a misuse of, or a, a, a wrong minded pursuit of knowledge because you're going about it through sources that we shouldn't have any recourse to. The third again is the losing sight of what's eternal and being caught up just in the here and now. That's kind of the, the, the temptation or the tendency, you know, when we just live on our phones or when we are, you know, um, just consuming entertainment indiscriminately, uh, it can kind of, um, it can draw us away from any sort of thinking about what's eternal, attending to the deeper spiritual side of who we are. Fourth is by seeking to know things that are beyond our abilities. So because they're of no use to us, it's kind of just vain knowledge maybe, uh, or because maybe it's, beyond us and by acquiring a little bit of information, a little bit of knowledge about something. You ever heard like a, people say like a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. You know, you can kind of uh, either get proud and puffed up or you can think you understand more than you actually do. Again, it's not wonder or serious study that we need to watch out for but it's sort of the superficial, the superficial flitting from thing to thing and the uh, desire that we have for frivolous knowledge. Okay, so that is the, uh, the seventh deadly sin of avarice or greed. Now I've prepared just a little bit something extra here. I, I said it to you the last time that I would just give you a little bit on temptation in general and kind of how temptation, how we experience temptation in our souls and uh, how we can fight temptation just in a general way. Um, but if you've got any questions about avarice or vice so far, or if anything comes up about temptation, again, you can just type it in your, in the chat box there. So thinking about just temptation in general, what is it? It's the encouragement to do what's wrong by our enemies. So for us, again, the enemies are our fallen human nature, the world, 
and the devil. And we'll look at the world and the devil um, more carefully in the next two weeks. What is God's place in temptation? God does not tempt us. It's really important to say that, right? Sometimes we think that God is, uh, is responsible for our temptations. He isn't. Um, in fact, uh, the word of God says that explicitly, that God cannot and does not tempt us. That's in the first letter, or that's in the letter of St. James, chapter 1. God doesn't tempt us, but he does allow us to be tempted by, again, the enemies that we have, the enemies of our humanity. Now, why would he allow us to be tempted? God actually brings good out of our experiences of temptation. The saints, our spiritual tradition, the scriptures kind of uh, all point us towards this. The first is, the first good thing that God brings out of it is, uh, in that struggle we have against temptation, we play a part in meriting heaven. God doesn't just sort of, um, God doesn't just, uh, what's the word? Leave us without any part to play. God wants to sort of, um, God has given us abilities. I mean, like significant, serious abilities. He created us, uh, in the way that he has so that we can actually cooperate and play a part in rising up and in uh, being united with him here and now, but also then in heaven. So in our struggle, we play a part in fighting for rising up and in meriting heaven. In temptation, we're also purified. By struggling in temptation, we're also purified. Where we learn humility. Often it's our experience of struggling, experiencing temptation and falling that makes us humble, makes us realize how much, how profoundly we need God and how um, our, our own poverty, how poor we are without him. And that struggle also makes up for uh, our negligences in the past and the, the past ways that we've, that we've sinned our past surrenders. St. Cyprian, who's one of the church fathers, talks about this, that it, uh, it does, um, let's get the word correct here. Um, it can be a penance for us, he says. Another thing that God can do, a good that he can bring out of our experience of temptation, why he lets us experience it in the first place, is it helps us to make spiritual progress. By facing and overcoming temptations, we actually make progress. Uh, we learn to distrust ourselves, and we also learn to trust in God more, and we seek in God's strength and protection. That's spiritual. That represents spiritual progress. Think about Jesus on the sea with the apostles. Do you remember that? Where Jesus is on the sea and he's sleeping in the, uh, in the stern of the boat and the storm kind of whips up and they're terrified. These are seasoned fishermen. They know what they're doing. And yet this is beyond them. And so they cry out to God, right? It's a great image for temptation. Temptation often feels like a storm that's kind of like um, about to overwhelm us and capsize the boat, so to speak. God teaches them that they, without him, they don't have what it takes, but with him, they can face anything. That represents spiritual progress, not just knowing that, but for that to become kind of internalized and the way that we really see and live our relationship with God. Okay, so what happens in temptation? Um, our spiritual tradition breaks down three different sort of moments in, if you just break down, it's like they, there's, there was a book written by Ronald Knox, I think it was, The Mass in Slow Motion. This is temptation in slow motion, just breaking it down very slowly, okay? So the first is, the first stage of temptation that we all experience is suggestion. The second is pleasure. 
And the third is consent, okay? So first of all, suggestion. There's a proposal made by our imagination or our mind. Again, maybe it's influenced by the devil or by the world, but it's, it, comes, uh, it comes before us through our imagination, through our mind. A suggestion of some thing that's wrong, some evil thing. Now, here's really important, okay? This thing can be really bad. It can be really bad, whatever it is that kind of pops into your mind. But if, provided we didn't provoke it, we didn't kind of conjure it up, there is no sin at this stage at all. We said this, uh, I think, when we were talking about lust. But, like, that experience of kind of... Uh, of thoughts just popping into our mind involuntarily is something all of us experience. And it's not just lust. It can be anger and unforgiveness. It can be envy. You know, it can be superiority, judgmentalism, and pride. You know, it can be a lot of different things that just kind of, whoop, all of a sudden it's there in your mind and you didn't sort of, uh, you didn't summon it or anything like that. It just is there, right? This is the level of suggestion. And again, provided we didn't kind of conjure it up or leave ourselves particularly vulnerable, we'll come to that in a minute, uh, that there's no sin in that yet. Second stage is pleasure. So a part of us, our fallen human nature, is drawn to this thing that's wrong, this evil thing, and is kind of, uh, would, would, would love it, would uh, find some pleasure in it, finds it attractive. Now, this is kind of, this is dangerous, obviously. We find ourselves now in danger because we're being, a part of us is kind of being drawn towards this. Usually it's what's called one of our lower faculties. So our, the kind of lower parts of our human nature and soul, we kind of drawn towards this thing. Uh, and what's, what's happening is our will is being sort of, uh, um, is, is facing this, this decision, whether to give into it or whether to stand strong. And that's dangerous, obviously, because it's being drawn now and enticed to give into this. But that pleasure, that sort of draw, it's important to say, it's still not a sin at this point. It's dangerous because, again, the will is being enticed in order to consent, maybe even strongly. But if the will doesn't consent, there's still no sin at this point. The third and the final stage of temptation is consent or not consenting. So consent, uh, when we talk about consent, it's, it's the will, that kind of seat of decision-making within our soul, when it gives up the fight and allows the soul to be overcome by the temptation. It's where we give up the fight and we allow the soul to be kind of uh, overcome by the temptation, yielding to that, the pleasure that was kind of enticing it, just kind of giving up. Or that moment can be the moment where you take a stand and where you, uh, in a sort of moment of self-mastery, you don't indulge in what you know to be wrong just because there's some there's something attractive about it but instead you choose not to do that that is not a sin but obviously that is a moment of real um like real virtue of of literally a virtue like strength it's a a meritorious thing it's a it's a it's a good thing so that consent doesn't have to result in action, but sometimes it does. So sometimes uh, that consent goes to the point of desiring to convert it into action and actually then just accomplishing it, doing that action. So just to kind of <clears throat> maybe give you a practical example. Think about, maybe some of you would know what this experience is like, but let's say you are thinking about someone or you're talking about someone or someone is mentioned to you and you remember 
something that they said to you before or some wrong that they had done to you. And all of a sudden now in your mind is this uh, suggestion to, uh, to really, to indulge in a, um, a real resentment of them and a, uh, a bitterness towards them. So that's the, that's the, the thing that popped into your mind, this memory of what this person had said to you and they never apologized or something they did to you. And now you experience an attraction to this thought. The attraction is the pleasure now is you want to linger on this and uh, you want to let this thought kind of be dominant in your mind and in your heart. And now your will is facing this dilemma, this decision. Will it allow itself to be overrun by this really strong passion to kind of pour over this wrong that had been done? Or will it stand strong? Well, let's say you allow this to overrun you. You're just, you're overcome by this. Our experience of being weak-willed, something we all have experienced, we're like, we're kind of overrun by this strong passion. And we find ourselves really giving over to it, consenting to, you know, these, these resentful and bitter thoughts about this person. But now it doesn't just stay there, right? Now it can be converted into action. So, you know, we can find ourselves then desiring to, to get revenge, to, cut, to get our own back. And then we can actually go ahead and do that, maybe by talking about them or gossiping or slandering their character or exposing what they did, you know, unnecessarily to someone else. That's temptation in slow motion. The suggestion, the pleasure, the, which is the enticement, and then that moment of decision where the will either stands strong or where it's overrun by whatever it is that's being, that's attracting it. How do we combat temptation generally? Well, uh, the best, well, no, I, I, I'm messing that, that phrase up. Uh, prevention is the best remedy, right? Um, before you ever have to fight that temptation, you have to sort of like make a brave, heroic stand uh, at that level of consent. Before you get to that point, it's better to prevent that situation from needlessly arising, if you can. Again, needlessly arising. So the wisdom of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane that he says to the apostles is really applicable here. He says to them, watch and pray so that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray. So watching and praying. Watching consists mainly in, uh, this by the way is not my advice. Again, this is the advice of like our spiritual tradition. Watching consists mainly in distrusting ourselves and in trusting God. What did St. Peter have to learn the hard way? that we don't have what it takes, uh, that when it comes down to it, if we're relying on our own strength alone, very often we're going to cave. But with God strengthening us, we don't need to be afraid. There's nothing we can't face with God. Uh, also, um, avoiding dangerous occasions where we would be exposed needlessly to tempting suggestions. So there are some activities in some places that we would do well not to go, especially if we're weak in that area. So if someone has a, you know, a, a predilection for, you know, drunkenness, not a good idea to go out to the pub regularly. Or if someone is inclined to, um, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, if someone is inclined to, uh, to greed, um, you know, maybe, or maybe curiosity would be a better example just off the top of my head. If someone's inclined towards curiosity, maybe like picking up your phone when you have an evening free and just saying, oh, I'm, I'll just check this thing out kind of mindlessly and not, 
not having a plan or something <laughs> a set amount of time would not be a good thing. You just kind of putting yourself in a position where it's very hard to, um, uh, to make a stand where it's easy to fall. And then prayer. So it's watchfulness. And then prayer is uh, all kinds of prayer. Any kind of prayer is good against temptation to fight temptation. So that's preventing temptation. Now you've got resisting temptation. Uh, the way that we resist temptations depends uh, on whether they're minor temptations or major temptations. If it's a minor temptation, the suggestion is from our spiritual tradition is to treat them like gnats or flies. I'm sure plenty of you spent time out in the bog, right? Uh, you can't escape them, right? There's no getting away from them. Uh, so don't give them more power than they need to have. Don't pay attention to them unduly, even though they're annoying you, even though they're biting at you, even though they're kind of pestering you. They can't hurt you, providing that you continue to serve God earnestly. So little minor temptations or whatever that you face, like brush them aside. Don't, don't be, uh, you know, concerning yourself with them unduly. Major temptations, we have to summon our, um, we have to summon our, our, our fighting spirit and we have to go after them. We have to go after them promptly, not really like entertaining them. We've got to do it energetically, not in a half-hearted way, resisting temptation or reluctantly saying like, well, all right, I'll say no, but I really, oh, I'd, if only I could, you know, no, like really energetically doing it with vigor, not half-heartedly, not giving up, doing it perseveringly, even though the temptation might come back again and again and again, stay at it, stay with it and uh, humbly fighting it making known what you're going through to a confessor or a spiritual director or a friend and asking for God's help, of course. So after temptation, we have experienced where we have faced temptation and we've overcome it. Well, in that case, thank God with all your heart who gave you that victory. And then if you give into the temptation, do not lose heart. That's really important. Do not lose heart. Remember that God, remember the welcome that God has for sinners. Rise from the fall to be more humble, more prudent, more earnest. That's from St. Augustine. Rise from the fall to be more humble, more prudent, more earnest. Okay, last thing is uh, just the, temptations, uh, people at different stages of the spiritual life, those of you guys who were paying attention, who were not paying attention, but who were there for the prayer sessions know about the three ways of the spiritual life. There are different temptations that are more prominent in different stages. So in the beginning, in the purgative way for beginners, uh, it's the temptations we face are those represented by the seven deadly sins, which is why we were covering what we were covering. Also by illusions about, which come from not understanding consolations and desolations. Inconstancy in our like relationship with God, sometimes being committed and sometimes not. And then over eagerness, sometimes someone when they're first starting out can be inclined towards over eagerness. And then finally scruples. For those who are in the illuminative way, who are who, have, who are on the path, let's say, and who are made some progress. The seven deadly sins can be awakened again and can kind of take a more spiritual, um, uh, can take more of a spiritual, what's the word? I don't know. It, it, they can come across in a, in a more spiritual way, come across slightly differently. And lukewarmness is also something that people who are in the illuminative way can face, illuminative way. And for those who are in the unitive way, there can be discouragement and trials, what they call spiritual gluttony, which is just like a, an over-attachment to consolation, vain complacency, and, and other things as well. So that's temptations, just in general. So 
Uh, I saw that there was a something in the chat. I'm just going to see what it is here. Does curiosity come under avarice or is it another separate issue under the lust of the eyes? Uh, it's considered, well, it's considered a, um, it's, it comes under avarice. So lust of the eyes really is just kind of, um, yeah, a, well, it's, I, it, it seems like a different thing. All right. But it actually is. It's, it's in all of the things that I've read, it was tucked in underneath um, avarice. Let me see here now. I'm just going to read this aloud. In our lives, then we have to find the balance between trusting in God to provide for us and not buying too much into financial fears expounded by the world, especially these days when we're living through a pandemic. Yes, we have to be responsible for our money and provision for others, mainly family first, and the excess to the needy, as you said. Ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, question mark. So easy to buy into fears as we know, we now know how little we actually control. That's so true, isn't it? That, I mean, this has been a, the anxiety is definitely something that more and more people are experiencing now. And uh, I mean, like all of us here are um, believers and are trying to grow closer to God. Can you imagine how disorienting this would be if you had no faith, if you thought that there was no God, or if you didn't have like a real, like um, a real trust in him? It's hard enough for us, um, you know, as you say, but I know I, I, I really feel for people. There's a lot of uncertainty that we're facing, a lot of uncertainty. Um, but yeah, that's right. We ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. And again, like we, we call to mind what Jesus points out to us. Like God provides, we have a provident father who provides for us what we need when we trust in him. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Just to say that the next two, the last two sessions that we have next Wednesday, what we're going to cover is what's called the world. And then the last section, the last week, we're going, to, we're going to address the devil. So to what extent does the, the world that is around us, the environment in which we live, to what extent does that affect us? And what, um, what are the ways that we, what are the things we have to be aware of? And what do we have to kind of fight against? And then the demonic, you know, the powers and principalities and uh, the sort of um, spiritual realities that are uh, invisible. What part do they play in our, uh, you know, in our fight, you know, to grow in union with God? And, uh, you know, what is our, like, what are the, the tools that are at our disposal to fight the, uh, the enemy? All right. Very good. So thanks very much, everybody. And uh, please, God, we'll see you next week. I'll, I'll just give you a blessing before we go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So I pray that God, Almighty God, would bless all of you and keep you. I pray that God would give you a greater knowledge of who he is and who you are, who he's made you to be, and that he would help you to come to love him more. May Almighty God give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.